Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. This is your host, Brian Funk. I make music as Afro DJ Mac. And today I'm really excited to talk to Christopher Oktvist. Christopher is the author of Making Sound, and it's a really great practical book on things you can do to make your music better, to add character, to make your productions just a little more professional. It's sort of like a a go-to book with um, very practical try this, try that, try this type of approach, which I really like because it gives you something to actually do within your productions. So how's it going, Christopher? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I really enjoy your work. You've done a lot of writing for the Pro Audio Files, and the mm -hmm. book is spectacular. It's um, Thank you. It's the type of thing where you could either read it cover to cover or just sort of open up to a specific part if you're looking for some help in a certain area. So I think yeah. it's um, a great thing to just sort of have on hand all the time. Yeah, yeah, that was that was kind of the uh, the idea <laughs> to to have it like as a uh, in the studio with you. You can you can just you know get ideas on the fly when you're working, um, and also like. Because you have the, the shorter tips that you can just use as you go, and then you can sort of read the more in-depth stuff in um, on your time off work. Yeah, you can kind of like just pick a little technique out, or you can get even like a little bit deeper by reading the full chapters and sort of picking up on the big picture of what you're trying to mm -hmm. do, which is really yeah. nice. Yeah, so I thought I'd ask you maybe just to tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in all this, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I started playing music when I was pretty young, um, playing in bands and you know, learning piano and guitar. And, um, and I had a dream of you know becoming a you know, rock star like, like a lot <laughs> of people. Um, that didn't really happen, but I... So I sort of got into a different career, uh, working in a publishing house, uh, editing and writing like language courses and stuff like that. Um, and every once in a while we record um, like audio books. So um, I, was, I started producing those. And um, mm. after a while when they didn't have a lot of work for me, I, uh, I tried to, to uh, I contacted the studio and I said, I, I'm pretty good at recording. So uh, maybe you can have some use for me. So I started working there instead, and that was sort of my first job in the uh, doing audio. So I did that for a uh, for a few years, and I went to audio school to get a little bit more knowledge and um, started combining the uh, the sort of music and the audio work. Nice. So I started my own studio after a few years. I I, I really like these kinds of stories. Um, I think a lot of us start off with that like rock star dream in mind. And then, uh, you know, it's, the, it's, I still have it though. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I think uh, it could be fun. It goes right? away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially if you pay attention to like all the highlight reels and <laughs> no. that, that stuff. But it's always like interesting to me how our, our paths kind of diverge from that and take these like, mm -hmm. sometimes they seem like they don't, you don't really see where they're going at the time, but looking back, it's a, it's an interesting progression that winds you up in a place that seems to fit your particular talents and, and style. Definitely. Yeah. It's hard to plan you know, life. It just, yeah. you no, know, it doesn't happen the way you think it would happen. So at least it didn't for me. So, uh, but it's, yeah, you, you, I get to do a lot of stuff that I, maybe I, that wasn't my main plan, but it's, uh, yeah, I think it works out pretty, pretty well. Yeah, it's pretty cool how like doing editing work could lead to recording some audio books and then therefore yeah. that leads into recording music. Do you and I was basically faking it because I didn't yeah. really know much about recording. I had recorded like, at home uh, just with a cheap interface and a microphone, but I came there and it was like this big consoles and I had no idea how to work it. So that was why I eventually went to audio school to mm -hmm. to learn a bit more about work in the studio because i love that but it was so stressful because i if someone changed like anything like from the last time i was there i had no idea right. how to <laughs> get back to where i was so yeah it's a matter of like kind of leaving everything exactly where you need it until the yeah. next time <laughs> like there's no sound it's like have you pushed a fader up um what what, what fader is that <laughs> right, <laughs> <No>. right. <laughs> what channel <laughs> pro tools was on so i had no idea what i was doing <laughs> 
Is the console on? <laughs> yeah. There is a light. I don't know. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I, I think like um, when I was starting out doing my own recording, I, I when I finally like started to get a little more serious, I saved up some money and, and bought a board and some eight app machines. No. My buddy and I we we chipped in together for this. It was like a, a dual, um, you know. <laughs> the result of all our life savings and yeah. it was very much like that like okay we got it set now don't touch it you know we're working on one song and you know we didn't have like yeah. computers to recall our all our settings so we would like leave everything and it'd be like you can't touch it you can't touch it you can't work on anything else we got the mix we got the balance <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. definitely a lot of like faking it or trying to figure it out yeah you yeah know, before we go that's a good approach, though. To otherwise, it's, it's, you can't really do start doing anything because you're gonna be a beginner at some at some point. And yeah, you need to uh, yeah, I agree with you on that. Like, there's there's nothing wrong with admitting you're a beginner, kind of. You know what yeah. I mean? I think as we like get older, we become like adults. You know, we feel like we're not allowed to be that way. Um, as a kid, you know, you'll try anything and you're willing to be terrible at it for a while. But yeah. As but I think as long as long as you can sort of make it work along the way, you're fine. You can always sort of look things up and ask people like when when the client isn't there. Mm -hmm. But you need to know enough to be able to pull the session off, you know, so you don't end up with with unusable you know, material recordings like that. Because um, then you got to get in trouble. But I think um, you can you can learn as you go mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I guess especially. I sure did. <laughs> I think we all are, right? Yeah. I, I I consider myself, you know, always learning. I don't think I'll ever think of myself as a master at anything, really. I think there's always room hmm. to grow. And I think when you kind of like decide, I've mastered this, in a lot of ways, you sort of close down your, you know, ability to learn anything new because you've yeah. you shut down to new information. Definitely. I, I learn a lot from complete beginners, actually, too. Just that fresh perspective that they have. It's, yeah. Sometimes our yeah, conventions get in the way. Yeah, I got a lot of questions on. I got a lot of questions on on Twitter, and and um, and it's it's really, it's good because I I forget sometimes that I, should, I didn't know how to do that either when I started out because it's mm -hmm. so long ago. Yeah. Um, but it's it's almost hard to get back to the feeling that like how does a door work like where what what you do like what do all these buttons do that that's something that it was so so long ago so it's um it's it's good to get those questions every once in a while so just remind you that it actually takes a lot of learning before you even like do the basic right. um stuff you know so um yeah i mean i encounter that a lot at my school that i teach at. i run a little music production club and it's for high school students and they'll they'll come in and they'll be working on something and i'll be like yeah just turn up the fader a little bit and they're like what <laughs> a fader like what are you talking about and like yeah. it all comes back to you like oh they, i should probably mention to you that this little thing here is actually how you turn the volume up and down and this green yeah. line here you see is the sound <laughs> you know it's very easy to just yeah. miss some of that stuff yeah absolutely you've actually get to yeah Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. You go ahead. No, it, it, it gets complicated quickly as well mm -hmm. because, like, when you start getting into like decibels and how that works, and you know, it, it just gets really complicated quickly. So it, it is. You don't need to know all the theory, but it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's something that it, it's quite difficult to to grasp uh, if you really want to understand how, how how things work. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing to remember. Is it is difficult, you know, as much as like. There's a lot of things out there that say like learn production in two weeks, you know, with my course. Or, no. you know, it, it's hard and it takes a lot mm. of training. And um, I teach a course for Berkeley Online using yeah. Ableton Live for sampling, and it's 12 uh -huh. weeks. But um, there's so much material, and I always try to stress that to my students. Like, listen, you know, some of the things we're talking about, you can spend a whole lifetime learning how to master. I mean, yeah. I don't think you're going to figure out a compressor in one week and know how to use it for any application. <laughs> this is a, no. a lifelong pursuit in a lot of ways and picking up yeah. on the subtleties of it. Absolutely. They're really deep tools. I mean, a compressor is, yeah, it seems simple <laughs> on the surface, but mm. 
yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard to get your head around it. Um, cause it's so different. Like if you're using, I mean, it's, yeah, I guess you can learn it pretty quickly for, for like a snare drum and stuff like that. But then you try to compress, um, you know, a guitar or vocals. It's just a different beast. Hmm. Yeah, it's something that I think when I first got my first compressor, uh, one of the uh, Alesis, uh, I got to get right here actually, the 3630. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, would, I just thought you just put it on everything. That's like what you do, you compress things. Yeah. And, you know, I, I would just see the line, the red line moving across telling me I have some gain reduction. I was like, I don't know, <laughs> that's what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd often find if I just turned it off, my mix sounded way better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> compression is probably the, the 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 hardest thing to to learn, like how to how to hear, like exactly what it's doing. Um, I think when you're just starting out and you're compressing like four dB, most of the time you're not going to be able to tell what's going on, like sound wise. So uh, I mean, it's a lot easier to hear EQ or, you know, mm. but it's something you. That, I mean, there are some tricks too. You know, to learn it, you, you do like extreme settings and like pull the threshold all the way down. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can play with the attack and release, and you hear what, what's going on, and then you just back it off, you know. But it's it takes time to hear those little subtle things, and they will add up, of course, and, and make a difference in the overall sound of a mix. Mm. Yeah, and that's something I think that's easy to miss is that if you do even just little things to each track over the course mm. of the full mix, they can be a really big effect. Yeah. It's surprising sometimes how little you can do, like you just notch out a uh, DB on a like couple of tracks and suddenly just it, the whole mix opens up because mm. there's like things clashing. Um, so that's a little goes a long way. And sometimes I think that's another thing, like you should, there aren't really any rules to to that, like how much you should EQ something, or you can because sometimes you just need like twelve dB of, of boost somewhere, and if it sounds the way you want it to sound, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and a lot of people they they when they use analog stuff, they don't look at it. when they use it, they just turn up the knob and sh oh, it sounds good, and then they, when they look at it, they they freak out because mm. it's like shit, that's so much. <laughs> Um, and you wouldn't probably do that in, in your door because you can see how much you're boosting and you feel like, ah, I shouldn't do this. I should probably, you know, fix this in some other way because it's, this is, this is too much, but that's, uh, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't really believe in rules that way. It's just. Yeah. So you're really talking about live and learn. like trusting your ear and not mixing with your eyes so much. Yeah. And, and, and probably, I mean, you're going to do that. You're gonna boost something too much, and you're gonna realize six months after that that it sounded horrible. But then you developed your ears, and you can actually hear that it didn't mm. sound good. But at the time, it's not gonna help you that much to uh, to have those rules because you're gonna mess something else up if your if your ears aren't there. You, you gotta just you know mess something else up in the, in the mix. So uh, I think it's better to do it, and then you realize that okay, I should probably shouldn't do that. Um, and you find other way, ways to get where you want to go. Mm. So, um, I mean, there are some rules that you can, you can. I don't know. I, I, maybe rules are just not the right word for it. But there's some guidelines, I guess. Mm -hmm. Some some things to help you, you know, get going uh, when you're a beginner. Right. Right. Yeah, because I think there's definitely a lot of learning that happens when you listen back to your old tracks and you go, "Whoa, <laughs> I, what was I thinking yeah. there?" <laughs> And sometimes the other way around too is like that sounds really cool because I mm -hmm. didn't know what I was yeah. doing, and I was like, I, I can, I can feel like maybe that sounds actually more interesting than a lot of the stuff I do now. Um, so sometimes you want to go back to that as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, how did I? What was I thinking when I did that? Uh, so you should. I mean, that you you can actually. You, I mean, you can do some really cool and unique stuff when you're a beginner um, if you have a bit of. Know, talent and a bit of luck <laughs> you can just yeah. stumble across some some really cool sounds that you maybe and that's what i try to do i, I think um i try to just just think about take like old concepts and 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 just you know turn it around some some way to to get like new ideas and new ways mm. to to think about stuff um 
I think that's been my idea behind the social media and um, production tips I write mm. in the book as well to just experiment a little bit and doesn't have to go to extremes but just you know um, like you try something that you would maybe use on one thing and you just think I mean I, that's why that's how my brain works I, I just instantly think okay so can I combine this with some other technique or can I use that in some other context uh, on something else and what's intended for and and that's um, I mean a lot of times it's not going to work but when it does you, you come up with something that inspires you and and then mm. you sort of you expanding your creativity in a way that's um, more personal, I think. Yeah, that's I've had fun. so many experiences like that. Where, for instance, like I I was learning music theory as I was learning guitar, you know, as like yeah. a teenager, and I learned my scales and all these like modes and whatever. And I can remember playing with other people that didn't know some of the theory. And every once in a while, they would do things that was just against the rules. Like, yeah. you're, you're not supposed to go to that chord. Like, what are you doing? But it sounds awesome. You know, it's a really nice flavor mm -hmm. to the music. And um, it's it's really, like, an interesting thing. Like, we, like you said, like, rules isn't, like, such a... You don't like that word so much because mm. there, there are, like, I guess, like, these conventions and guidelines. But yeah. it's, there are always, there's always room to break them a little bit. Always room to just explore outside of them. Yeah. Your Twitter Absolutely, page is, yeah. is a really cool source, and it seems like that's um, where you um, do a lot of your activity online. Yeah, that's where it all started. <laughs> oh, yeah? Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I tried, um, I had a blog, but that didn't really go well, and uh, I tried Instagram as well. So like, I, I guess Twitter was like the third, my try i did um and it just took off um, pretty quickly and and i got you know um dan from pro audio files wrote to me and asked me to start writing for for his blog hmm. so um that was sort of the uh the way into writing a book and and all that so so twitter is still that's where i i spend a lot of time there uh i think it's a great way to because they just really seem to work really well there i doesn't work as well on Facebook or Instagram, but, but Twitter is like the perfect platform for, for just writing like really short um, tips that you can use straight away. Yeah, people, uh, people respond really well to it, but then if you like link to some like free like article or something, um, they don't really have, have the uh, patience to, <laughs> to <Yeah>. go there. <laughs> they just want something they can use right away. And, the, um, and that, I mean, it's, it's inspiring to to do it in that format, to, to, to write something really short that you can just sort of, ah, use straight away. Mm -hmm. um, and now you have more characters to use as well. I think they doubled it, so I can go a little bit more in depth than before. It was, it was quite challenging before. It was like 140 characters, I think, uh, you could use. So that was really limiting, <laughs> but now. Yeah. So I go back to some of my old tweets and I, I sort of flesh them out a little bit. Uh huh. And tweet them oh, again. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like this little like bit you can get, and it, if you are say in the middle of producing, you can kind of go mm -hmm. to the Twitter page and just really quickly get something and then get right back to work. Whereas like a video right. tutorial or an article might suck you away for long enough to lose your groove and lose yeah. your whole show. You know. Yeah, I think people. I mean, sometimes you really need all that time because it's like a deep, pretty complex concept, but most of the time I think I, I don't have the patience to to look at a, like a 30 minute video. <laughs> uh, if you can't explain it in like five or six minutes, it's it's just probably not gonna happen. Um, yeah, I have well, a, I have Unfortunately, a... because I, I, I wish I could sit down and like really look at the longer ones because uh, you, you're definitely gonna learn more. But it's just hard to take the time to do that. I, I agree. I have a shamefully low attention span on any YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> I have second Same thoughts as, as soon as it reaches like three minutes. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I could, you know, devote that kind of energy and time. 
Yeah, and 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 you always, I I feel like you want to hear the end result at the beginning, so you know if it's worth it. But I know I've been guilty of of doing it the other way around. I've, mm -hmm. I, when I've done a few videos, I I don't think I always do that because there's something about you sort of want to explain things like what you're doing before you. Yeah, you know what I mean, because because it's uh, it might just if someone just hears something and they don't understand the process and they don't understand what I did to the sound where it went from. You know what I had to do to get there. Um, they don't really understand the value of it, so it's yeah, it, that's a different beast. But I, I'm, I'm, I'll gonna be doing more videos as well. Hmm. Nice. I think the Twitter page, by the way, I'll put this in the show notes. But just so yep. anyone that wants to check it out now as they're listening, it's at mgntc sound. So it's like magnetic sound, right? Yeah, without, without the vowels. Right? Without the vowels and magnetic. <laughs> yeah. And then sound. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's pretty easy to find music production tips. Um, mm -hmm. Really helpful, especially if you want like something that will only take away about like five to ten seconds of your time. <laughs> yeah. It's a good place. <laughs> it I, is, and there's a lot of like discussions going on as well. Like, I, it's, it's good. Uh, there's a lot of feedback from... from yeah, I do see some of the things there. generate a little bit of controversy sometimes because <laughs> you're sort of challenging some of the uh, tried and true things or the rules yeah. that people follow. People are, I mean, surprisingly surprisingly nice, though. I, I, I mm -hmm. thought when I started out on social media that people would be just well, say really negative stuff, but that was, I mean, almost nothing. I mean, I've done this since two, 2013, and mm -hmm. I like maybe three or four really nasty comments and the rest has been just really good feedback. I, I kind of find the same thing. Um, I think maybe sometimes the nasty comments sort of reverberate in your head a little bit longer yeah. or, or, or uh, kind of <laughs> agitate you and get you emotionally excited sometimes. But on the whole, I mean, I think, you know, people are, are really cool and appreciative yeah. of, um, you know, when people share their ideas and take the time to do that with with the community it's because it is like amazing that we have um you know sources like your twitter page for instance i mean just 15 years ago could you imagine mm. like, how valuable that would be and yeah I, I wish youtube was around when i started out uh, it would have been so helpful yeah oh yeah that that really uh I mean, I, I just, with my wife, we just installed a patio in our backyard. I mean, we would have had no idea how to do that, yeah. that YouTube. That was a big help for sure. That's so cool. <laughs> Although it was a little deceiving. That. No one in that video was sweating. No one was dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I was a sweaty, dirty mess by the time we were done. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little uh, Hollywood magic, I think, but yeah. <laughs> it did help a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. He's a great resource, for sure. <laughs> And it's still free, so it's that's, that's something that hasn't changed too much since it mm. you know, came out. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. I hope it did, stays did, that they way. They didn't manage to destroy it. No, I got some sort of ad the other day. You can you can buy like a premium membership now, and you don't get any ads. Mm. But I don't think the ads are too bad yet. So not too bad. You can usually skip them, right? And yeah, and they are a little directed towards what you are interested in. Which yeah, exactly. Is either good or bad, depending on if you're paranoid and <laughs> you don't trust the internet like that. Yeah, but I think that's inevitable these days. <laughs> yeah. So the book yeah. "Making Sound: mm -hmm. Creative yes. Music Production Tips and Philosophies." Yes. And, uh, it's for me. It's like such a cool balance of how I like to talk about music and think about it, where it's very practical, but then there's also this like philosophical edge to mm -hmm. it where you know it, the, a lot of the tips and discussions you have within the book have this bigger philosophy and s some of it you've already touched on a little bit and like challenging the conventions and mm -hmm. not just doing things because you're supposed to you know yeah i think it's sort of got like it's funny how you know the twitter page is almost like the opposite of a book it's these little quick short things <laughs> but the yeah. book the book has that quality to it also you know, mm. I think you have like seventy-five tips or so. Yeah, and um, the uh, yeah, the sec second edition is coming out out soon as well. Oh, cool! Uh, so I think it's almost like forty percent more. I've added added content, so uh, and that's going to be 
like a free update for anyone who bought the first edition. So oh, nice. That's yeah, very cool. It's not too often you get like an update to a, to a book. You know? No, I, I I did promise that at the beginning, so I I have to uh, <laughs> stay true to my word. Um, but that's no, I think that's cool. That's it, uh, I'm really grateful that it's been received so well and people seem to like it and they buy it. So yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, people expect that now of like their apps and their their yeah. software programs. They, you know, I pay one ninety nine for an app and expect updates for life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of not fair <laughs> yeah. to the developers, but that's really cool that you're doing that. But I think, I mean, the uh, the idea was when I wrote it was because because sometimes people are surprised when they when they first open it because it's not laid out like a typical like a you know mix engineers handbooks sort of mm -hmm. thing but i um i sort of want to come from the i don't i don't I'm not going to explain like how a compressor works from from scratch i, I want to just you know go the other way and say okay what, what do you want to do what do you want to achieve what sort of like mood what sort of um feel do you want to uh create and just look at the tools from that perspective and say okay so if you want to get a bit more aggressive if you want to do this you can you can use a compressor for that you can do this with the eq and you um so really understand why you're choosing to use a specific tool instead of just you know, slapping on a compressor and eq on every track um without really knowing what, what you what you're listening to you know listening for um yeah i think that's what i love about the book right there is you start out with the question why you know, oh. you know, you start out with like, why are you using this device? So often we just think, well, we're supposed to EQ, we're supposed to compress, mm -hmm. and we don't even know why we're doing it. But, oh. you know, for instance, like you've got, like your first section is on creating different textures and moods. And yeah. there's your why. Like, so you want to change the texture of this drum kit, or you want to change the, the character of the sound. Okay, yeah. there's your reason. Now here's how you use the tool to get to it. Yeah. Which is so refreshing because you don't always get that. You don't always get that approach where people start with, why am I doing this? It's such an important question to ask yourself. Otherwise, you wind up just kind of throwing in, it, it'd be like a cook, a chef or something, you know, just yeah. saying, yeah, we're just going to take every ingredient we have and throw it on every, <laughs> every single dish. And uh, you know, <laughs> that's what we have them for, right? <laughs> yeah. That's, we, we always end up in the uh, like cooking analogies. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's always seems to work, but that's, yeah, it, it really, it's really true. Um, and yeah, I, I find myself using like compression a lot less mm -hmm. now than when I, I started out because I, I just it doesn't happen as much. As I, 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 I feel like I need it. Mm -hmm. I, I use a lot of saturation and you know, distortion, and that really does what what um compression does so i don't need both of them I, I do that for like more like movement and shaping the transient and so um yeah hmm. yeah um i think that's um something that you you just said uh made me think about like um how you are uh taking um like a lot of analogies from other forms of art yeah you know, so like, um, th I think that's at the end of the book where you start talking about like um, finding other art forms, whether it's painting or, or right, yeah. Uh, are there anything, any types of uh, activities you like to pursue that you see a nice connection with with your work with music? Hmm. Yeah. Well. Um... I'm sure there is. I'm just <laughs> trying to think of. Um... I had a breakthrough myself when I started thinking about mixing, like painting. Yeah. When I when I saw like the frequencies as um, right. parts of the canvas, literally almost uh -huh. like you take the frequency chart, and I picture that yeah. that rectangular graph as a canvas. Yeah. And I kind of realized like I can't paint everything in the lower left hand corner where the base is. No. <laughs> You have to spread it out, and it it made me think, I guess, and learn about like um, yeah. masking frequencies and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about film and like television mm. a lot, uh, like um, 
how you give little hints to the listener or the viewer before something like major happens. Oh. Um, I think that goes for for both film and music. That if if something just happens without you know any any sort of warning, it's gonna be just too abrupt for for the you know, listener or the viewer. So um, and like I look at the different scenes, like the verse and the the uh, the bridge and the chorus. Um, so how you how you sort of um, go into one, one, from one section to another? I think that's pretty similar. Um, yeah. Like you need some okay, you need to hear, you need to understand like the intensity needs to build up a little bit before the before the chorus. Um, to give you a sense of okay, not now now the uh, the big drop is coming, you know. Hmm. Um, and I I yeah I like and also because you can look at the whole track like um like a movie or or when you you come back to to a different like the same sort of the same type of section like a second verse or something, it should tell a different story and like this i mean this of, of course goes for lyrics as well but also instrumental music i think it should tell this another part of the story it shouldn't tell the same story as the first verse right. um so um yeah it's and that comes down to arrangement as well like what are you trying to what's the story you're trying to tell why are you choosing that instrument um what what is what, what part is that instrument playing um because, yeah, I think that's that's that's, that's really important. Um, I mean, both like you can you can look at arrangements like frequencies and and like and that's that's really important that you should you shouldn't put too many parts playing in the same register. Like you have mm. two guitars, you can play different octaves, so you so they don't clash like frequency wise. But it's also important to think about why. Are they there? What 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 does this what what sort of emotion is this bringing to the story uh, to the song? Hmm. And it might be this brings a bit of like intensity because you want that in this part, or it sort of gives almost like a sentimental feel. Right. Right. Um, so when you start thinking about it, like story wise i think arrangement sort of falls into place a lot easier because that's really i mean it's really hard to to arrange a song if you're not really sure what you're going for you yeah. just end up stacking a lot of stuff on top of each other and not really knowing why you you've chosen that type of sound that type of rhythm hmm. so yeah i get myself in that problem a lot <laughs> Especially yeah. uh, working in Ableton Live, like in a session view, where you're not <laughs> doing an arrangement at all, really. You're just kind of throwing ideas on the, you know, into clips. And it can become very easy to just sort of like layer apart to death. And now you got like one section of a song that's really <laughs> got a hundred things going on yeah. and nothing else yet. There's no other part of the song. <laughs> There's nowhere yeah. to go. And I think a lot of us get stuck in that like eight bar loop world. Where we just yeah, kind I, I I still work in Ableton, but I, I actually had to stop using um, the uh, session view because I just kept getting stuck. So I, uh -huh. I, I, I and after a while I said, okay, so when I when I have like three scenes or whatever, I, I need to start recording into arrangement arrangement view, and but then I just found that okay, I, I'll just I, I'll do it in arrangement view from mm. from the beginning. That's yeah. that's because I get I I'll, I get an arrangement so much quicker and. I don't end up with all these loops that won't, you know, become songs in the end. So uh, I use it a lot more like a traditional door, but I, mm. I still like doing it. But I, I, I don't even go into session view anymore. Mm. I do that to like um, to warp stuff, and sometimes you have to, but I, I don't use it for production. That's or, fun. I have yeah. I have been advising students to try to get into the arrangement view as yeah. fast as possible. You know, I. Like you, you get your ideas together in session, but try to get into arrangement view quick. And uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe I should just take your approach. Just get into arrangement view from right from the beginning. I mean, it's really cool for for live. Like if you want to play yeah. stuff live, if you want to jam, um, 
but you can sort of jam with yourself as well. It's, it, it definitely has its uses, but if if I if I do something in a more traditional way, just I write something, I, I start producing it, I, I just go into arrangement view mm -hmm. and I, I use it like Logic or Pro Tools or mm -hmm. the other door. Nice. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I find that if I can get there sooner than later, I, I tend to get things done more often. You know, coming up yeah. with that arrangement. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to ask you just about a few things like that come up in mm -hmm. your book and maybe just get you to talk about it a little bit because sure. um, a lot of what you talk about really does align with a lot of the things that I appreciate about music. Um, and that's like, um, for instance, like things like humanizing electronic mm -hmm. music and beats that you program, lo-fi character, um, stuff yeah. like that. Can I ask you a little bit about like stuff you do to try to make things sound a little more natural, maybe a little more mm -hmm. human? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah. What, any specific, like we're, we're talking about like drums or any type of... Yeah, sure. It could be drums. It could be just mm -hmm. general, but sometimes things sound a little stale and sterile. Um, yeah, when you're working inside the box. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Um, I like um, I like adding like some sort of noise, some sort of texture. Um, on, like you can use like a, you can find it online, like all these ambient recordings, like street noise and um, the sound of a fire burning or something, and you can mess around with it to make it less obvious, and and just put it like behind the drums. And compress it with the drums as well and you just turn it down so you just get these little sort of glitchy or, or um, variations going um, that's something that can be really cool and you can get all almost like little ghost notes happening and you can just you know cut things up and move things around and experiment and see uh, if something sort of plays with the uh, with the uh, the rhythm of the beat so that's that's one thing I do um, and I mean if you have everything just really sort of quantized to the grid you can um, just tap in like manually delays to to uh to get delays to be a little bit off uh, you can get a bit more different feel that way um what else i mean there's a lot i i one thing is to if you use like a virtual instruments like addictive drums or easy drummer i think uh, or always just pull down the velocity like all the way almost mm -hmm. and just you know you, you push it up almost like you're mixing like with a fader you just and and listen to to the rest of the arrangement like is is this does this sound natural in this context because most of the time it's just it's, it's there's no dynamic um mm -hmm. by default and it's just Samples mean that just the drummer is just playing them too hard, so um, it doesn't sound natural to me. So I I like just lowering the velocity and and um, you can, you can get a lot of you can get things to sound really big as well if you if you have a sample of a drum like being hit pretty lightly and then you compress it, it can get really big because you tend to sort of like choke it when you play it too hard, so it doesn't it doesn't get that natural like resonance um yeah there's a lot of things you can <laughs> i yeah. like i like using transient designers on on percussion loops shaker loops mm. and uh yeah, you can I've automate you it that before yeah that's one of my favorite yeah. <laughs> favorites um are so you, you using can, you um, the drum bus at all for that inside of live the what the new uh, the drum bus device no, actually, I I'm still on uh, Ableton Nine. Okay, that's what, what we're up to ten now. Yeah, yeah. I haven't I haven't I haven't upgraded it, so I I don't, I don't know about that. What what is that? Is it like a compressor? It's sort of like a a few things in in one. There's a compressor going in, um, and it's yeah. it's just like turn on the compressor. That's it. There's no real settings. Um, okay, and there's some. Um, distortion some saturation you can do but there's this one oh, cool. particular knob called transient and it's set like in the middle you know at 12 mm -hmm. o'clock okay if you turn it to the right it's sort of i think on either way you turn it it does emphasize the transient a bit but when you turn it to the right it sort of mm -hmm. pulls out the decay a bit so it's really nice for making the room sound louder oh nice 
But if you turn it to the left, it mm. does the opposite. You can take away the room noise and you get really just the transient. Yeah. I found that, yeah, that, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I found it actually, I've used it on a lot of things besides drums. Um, I've used right. it on the podcast actually, where I've gotten recordings from people that mm -hmm. were in like very echoey rooms. And I yeah. turn the transient to the left, turn it down so that I'm losing that room noise. Because I think uh, when people talk, generally, they're not very long, sustained sounds. They're, they're usually quick little words, you know? Yeah. So it was really pretty interesting how I was able to use like a transient designer to clean up a vocal. Yeah. A voiceover kind of thing. No, that's really cool. I, I, I use that um, as well. I think the... Uh, I think the original transient designer was by SPL, as at least the first I heard about, uh, and they have a plugin called I think the Reverb, mm. and I think that's essentially that's just the uh, sustain part of the transient designer. I think yeah. so. That's basically what you do. You just turn down the sustain, and you 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 get a lot of the room out of the way. Um, so yeah, that's that's really cool. I transient designers are so so cool. They they um, you can use them for so much. Um, you can use them on. I mean, no, you can use them on a, on a like real room when you're recording, but you can use it on reverb as well. Mm. Um, and I find sometimes you can, when you use like a, a rhythmic, um reverb, that sounds a bit cheap. Maybe when you use it on drums, you can sort of tighten it up. Um, just turn, put up, insert a um, transient design on the reverb on the aux, and just turn down the sustain a little bit and turn up the attack just a little bit, and you get like a much tighter room sound for for drums and, and percussion and stuff like that so it's pretty cool actually you can you can do a lot with that i think that's the type of thing too like we were saying that over the course of the mix really adds mm -hmm. up where it might not sound so bad on a solo track but if yeah. you have that going on over and over and over it can yeah. get muddy quick you can use hardware as well. Like it doesn't have to be expensive. I I love buying like vintage microphones. Yes. Um, yeah. And you can use that. You to, like mic up your speakers, and um, you get really you really get out of the uh, sterile sterile um, mm. digital environment. Um, so that's pretty cool. I I I used to to buy a lot of old mics from off of eBay. And it's just it doesn't cost you a lot of money. Mm. But they can sound really. You can get a sound that you, there's no other way to to get that sort of sound. There's no plugins or anything that's, that's going to get close to that. Uh, yeah, I found that. And this kind of occurred to me as I started buying some like decent microphones. That as much as they sound really nice and clean, it almost like therefore makes room for your kind of crappy microphone to shine. Yeah. There was uh, a microphone, uh, my friend that I mentioned before, <laughs> where um, his grandfather is big into garage sales, so he would yeah. always find him something, anything musical he'd pick up for him. And he yeah. had this one microphone that was just this, it was like a cheap Radio Shack microphone. Mm -hmm. And sort of as a joke, we just would put it up on the drum kit because we had one more channel still on our mixer. Yeah. But we found like it, really did a lot for the recording it, it was amazing that like this one microphone would just suddenly pull something else out of that drum sound that the other clean you know more professional mics were missing yeah and just give it like a little grid a little life yeah that it was it was one of those experiences like those learning experiences where you realize oh wow you know sometimes like again, like you're supposed to use the right mic, the right situation, yeah. and then you break that rule a little bit. Absolutely, I I remember years ago I I listened to uh, it was a friend's band um, and they recorded like an EP or something, and and one of the songs they just used they they recorded in the studio and then used like um, traditional like mic uh, drum miking techniques. Um, and the other track, they used the laptop and just recorded the drums through the laptop mm. the mic. And it just sounded so cool. And and that was like, everyone just loved that track more than the other one. Really? Because it's, it's just, it just sounded really, really different. And the other was, I mean, so it can be pretty boring sometimes when you just do things too well. I mean, you just use these really safe sort of techniques. Um, then, of course, you can, you can do a lot of it. And, 
in post or in, in mix. But um, but yeah, I I I think it has definitely has its place to use cheaper <laughs> gear yeah. sometimes just to get these unique effects. Yeah, don't throw away your old garbagey microphones, everybody. No. <laughs> Yeah, I find it too with like, I have this little practice amp, this little Fender. I don't even know if it's an eight inch speaker. It's a little tiny thing, you know, it's called yeah. the, the bullet. And yeah. that thing, as, although it can be like really piercing and terrible sounding, there's, mm -hmm. there is like a little spot if you crank it up on its clean. Yeah. You know, not on the distortion one, but the clean. And it just like breaks yeah. up in such a nice way yeah. at, a, at a pretty low volume. Yeah. So it's got its place. And for that reason, you know, I've never gotten rid of it because it's just, there is like a kind of a magic spot in that thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but as I, I love using like analog gear. It's fine. I, and I, I, I write about that in the book as well. Like it doesn't have to be expensive. You can use a, you can buy a, a tape machine or, use guitar pedals and you get get really cool sounds and mm. it doesn't have to sound super like lo-fi either i mean i i use my uh tape machine like a revox from 19, 1960s and and if i want it to sound clean it can sound like super clean um just get a little bit of the tape saturation but i can i can also just go for full-on distortion on, on mm -hmm. like bass and drums and it sounds really cool hmm. yeah i think that's a fun thing to do i i think there's a lot of value in just running the signal through some electronics almost yeah. almost doesn't even matter what it is but it just gives it something there's like a little bit of life that happens along the way yeah and it's fun it's yeah uh, it, it makes you smile and i think it makes you like that recording a little bit more mm -hmm. than if you just used plugins because you know you you have the memory of of doing that and and you know so it, it does something and it's almost like you get this like emotional thing with it um yeah so i i think it's worth doing just for that just just because you you're having you have you're having fun when you do it and you're going to remember that when you i know a lot of tracks i've i've, I've made that i i just I love it because I know, yeah, I know that bass went through that, and I, I, it took me like half an hour to set everything up, and just like, and it might not matter to the listener, but I, I'm gonna like it a little bit more, and I'm probably gonna finish it just because of that. <laughs> you know, if I yeah. have like a lot of tracks and I just finish a few of them, that might be one of them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's that like kind of like little secret you know that's going on in there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it that kind of taps into one of the things that uh, I'm learning about myself more and more about making music is that I I really do love the sort of like exploration part of it, the kind mm. of like almost like uh, to bring it back to an analogy, almost like I'm some explorer looking for new land, just trying to see what will happen if I go this way or that way. Yeah, the surprise of it to me is really fun. It is. It's always, I mean, it's, it, when you start doing things like, you know, exactly from, from start to, 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 to finish, like what you're going to do and how you're going to achieve certain stuff. I, I don't really see the point I mean, doing it anymore. It, it's, uh, it's always like you explore something and you, you have like an idea of where you want to go, but on, on the way there, you might find some other interesting path and it's going to take you to a slightly different location. So, um, that's part of the fun for me as well, at least. Yeah, it's true. I think sometimes I'll find like a really good workflow and I'll do it a bunch of times and then I find myself getting bored with it, even if it's really effective, even if it works well. No. There, there needs to be that kind of adventure part to it. The, even, yeah. if, even if it's to the detriment of the recording sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one thing you talk about a lot in, in the book that I think is so important is um, the idea of like contrast. Yes. Um, I know like um, a lot of times we get this in our head and I, I, I hear it a lot with people that are, they'll ask me questions like, you know, I want my verse to be huge. I want my chorus to be really big uh -huh. and wide and I want this to have a lot of motion here. 
and the the uh thing i always come back to is like well you're talking in these relative terms right you want your guitars to be huge yeah. so in order for them to be huge something else has to be small i mean yeah. I might look huge next to an insect, right? <laughs> but put me next to Mount Everest and I'm, I'm a tiny thing. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about some ways you like to give your tracks impact and create this contrast so that we can mm -hmm. get like our sounds to have those powers that we want and the emotional right. impact. Yeah, I think you said it. I mean, it's, it's about you, you can't make everything huge all the time because then nothing is huge um so um th there's a lot of like automation uh, i mean the arrangement first of all um i okay i mean contrast can be a lot of different things but now we're talking about like the dynamics of a song like like make something sound big um so let's um you can use first of all you need to uh have less things have going on like before the chorus just just to 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 make that sound really huge but there's a lot of like autom little automation you can do you can um back off the bass just i mean if you have if you have the bass uh, if you have the, the verse where you want it like uh with the low end um try like inserting the eq and just use a shelving filter and maybe just back off a db or two and then you automatically so you just you mute the EQ when the chorus hits and you mm. get instantly and you can do the same with the uh the top end. So you get a bit more low end and a bit more high end when the chorus hits. So you get a little contrast and you can you can do that in a subtle way. You can do that quite noticeably, but um I think that most of the time it works better in a subtle way. Um I you can I like doing the like um you can do it on the on the on the master bus as well. Just go up like a one one D B on the master bus. Um that's almost like a subconscious thing. I think mean, most of these techniques are. You don't you can't really tell what's going what changes, but you know, you feel it. Hmm. It just um has more impact. And then also what you can do is you can make just one like the the first downbeat of course you can make that a bit louder so it you really sort of um push into the limiter and then you go back to normal so uh the brain will still feel like the whole chorus is loud because right. you get that initial like really loud sound coming in <clears throat> it shouldn't be i mean the difference shouldn't be that much but like um turn up a few db mm. and you can really use that and you don't have to have the whole chorus be be louder so that that's pretty that's pretty cool um and also you can yeah that's not really the same thing but i, I like automating the the uh, tempo as well so you just go up like a one right. or two bpm mm. so you feel like you get a little bit more energy but you don't really notice that it's, it's going faster that's something that would always happen in bands I played in. You get to the chorus yeah. and everyone gets excited. And, <laughs> and it was, yeah. uh, th that's one of the funny things that I find myself doing in um, my music is that was a mistake, you know, in the band, mm -hmm. technically, right? But I find myself missing those little mistakes, those little like yeah. human, like emotional jolts, like, oh, we're going to this exciting part. And we speed up a little. Yeah, that's what you're trying to recreate now <laughs> when yeah. you're working uh, like uh, in the in the box. But it's, yeah, definitely, uh, it's, you don't want to go too far because that's uh -huh. annoying. When yeah. the drummer speeds up too much, but if you get a little bit of that, you're gonna it's gonna be a cool effect. You're gonna feel it. Yeah, and a lot of times those those jumps in speed, I wouldn't notice while we were playing. But it's no. the listening back when you're analyzing it, you're being critical <laughs> of your performance. You're like, hey, we sped up a lot right here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you go back and listen to the track again, and it's like, whoa, it's way slower now <laughs> than it ended. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but also, I think that, like, it comes down to arrangement that you can, you can like maybe shorten the bass notes in the verse, because mm. uh, that would also, even if you don't like touch the EQ, if you have the same 
the amount of like low energy um, from the bass. But if you have shorter notes, still it's gonna sound, it's gonna feel like you have less bass. So when you do it more like longer notes in the chorus, it's gonna feel like it's a lot more going on. And so that, that's something you can do as well. And I like that when when you feel like there's a little too much, it's the mix is a bit bass heavy. But if you start EQing the bass, you, you lose something, you lose some impact. And I, I like just messing with the bass notes a little bit, just shorten them. Yeah. And you get a lot of the problem out of the way without sort of affecting the tone or the impact. Right, right. Yeah, that seems to be like a theme I'm seeing in a lot of the stuff you talk about in, in the book and in some of the tutorials too, mm -hmm. is, is not necessarily reaching for like the compressor or the EQ or the effect, but going back into doing little things, whether it's the transient or now, like you say, like the, uh, the, the length of the notes. For, for me, arrangement is, my, it's so important. But it is harder to teach and harder to learn than the mixing, so I think um, we don't talk about it as much. But if you can, I know when I when I mix for other people, it's it's a lot of the work is just trying to compensate for for a, an arrangement that doesn't yeah. really work. Because if the arrangement is just perfect, it's most tracks are quite easy to mix because mm -hmm. things aren't clashing and and it's pretty balanced the way it is you're just gonna sort of enhance it and make it sound better but but you don't have to fix a lot of problems because a lot of the problems you fix in the mix is just due to bad arrangement you have to you know use a lot of eq because there's um, masking going on all the time all the, yeah all the time because we're playing basically the same parts um at the same time so yeah that, that's arrangement is something yeah I think, I think that's, that's going to be my next next book. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you're right. I think that a good mix starts there, with the yeah. arrangement and deciding what sounds to put in and what sounds to layer in. And that that painting yeah. analogy helped me get there. And something I started doing when I made my like um, live performance set, so where I was taking like lots of different songs and putting them into one Ableton Live session, yeah. and using the session view to switch between tracks, is I organized my clips on frequency really uh, so i started mm -hmm. with like my drum tracks on track one percussion stuff was track two but then track yeah. three was bass and then track four was like low mids like this is like yeah. literally what i called it the mids and like leads mm -hmm. and like i thought of it really as just like stacking the frequencies and it oh, cool. it helped me a lot to realize because there were certain tracks where I was like, I, I, I have like five things for low mids. Where does this go? Yeah. And I realized, well, this is also the one that sounds kind of sloppy compared to the other tracks yeah. too. And no, that's, it, a, that's, a really, that's a really cool approach. I like that. It's kind of how I think about things now. I, I think about like, okay, I've got like this foundation. Now I need to just build it, you know, yeah. almost like, I don't know, making a sandwich. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, like with <laughs> frequencies or something. Yeah, but I think I'm I'm glad to hear you say that because it makes me feel like I'm onto something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good approach. That's you need to be conscious of what you're actually adding to the mix uh, mm. or to the song to the arrangement, um, and that's a, way, a good way to look at it. I've already got this part, you know. I've already got this area covered, so yeah, you can often get more, you know. It, I'm I'm so into like sound design. I'm so into like making mm -hmm. cool sounds, and yeah. the the problem is the more stuff I add, the less you can hear the detail of every sound. Yeah, you start missing all those like cool like artifacts that you know you yeah. spent so much time on. It gets lost in all the other sounds. But it's good because I mean, if if you know that, that some of the sounds they're all like low mid um, sort of sounds, you can also see the arrangement like hey they shouldn't be all playing at the same time they mm -hmm. can sort of alternate and you build build like a arrangement out of that um so that that's a good way to have like a visual understanding of how you where you should put things and right. um what elements shouldn't you know play at the same time all the time um, hmm. yeah yeah that's a good idea too so our our big uh 
challenge often is finishing stuff, right? Yeah. And you got a nice little section on there. And I like some of the approaches you have. Um, the Eisenhower box, for instance. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right, yeah. So you have the uh, the urgent, the not urgent, important, and not important. So you can put things in different categories. It's like something that's urgent and important, you need to do it right away. Because mm -hmm. that's something I, I, I find it really hard to, uh, to sort of um, see what's what, what what's what's more important than something else because a lot of times i feel like everything is just important and i want to have different projects going on and some of them they you know pay my bills so i can't really skip them but then i have like my own personal music um and that's if i skip that i mean that's really important to me um so that's yeah so this is, this is a way to organize it so you have the urgent and important so you should do it now and then you can have something that's important but not urgent um, and urgent and not important that say delegate it so you can you know try to get rid of that mm -hmm. task in, in some some way and they have not urgent not important that you can just drop that altogether yeah <laughs> get that out of but the mix I, I, haven't, I haven't really used this the Eisenhower box like uh, myself in that way it's 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 a good way to uh, to visualize it, but mm -hmm. definitely use those sort of categories when I when I um, try to make sense of you know, what my 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 plans are and how, how to sort of attack <laughs> all the work yeah. I've got. Yeah, it seems like a good thing to use in conjunction with like a deadline. Yeah, and, and that's something you mentioned too, like the importance of deadlines. I think even self-imposed deadlines are really good to have because music yeah. is never really finished right i mean you could really <laughs> experiment and try things forever mm -hmm. you have to sort of after a while just say okay i'm gonna just stop here <laughs> yeah absolutely um and i think in, in the same chapter i i talk about using timers mm. when you're working and that's something that's one of my favorite technique favorite tools um to use when there's when i don't really feel inspired to to do something but I, I really need to do this to get to the next you know uh, thing i'm going to do so it might be if i'm working on a song okay i need to arrange the whole track i'm having fun with like an eight bar loop but i need mm -hmm. to arrange it before i i you know can add different elements to it and you can use a timer like the, the pomodoro technique is you use you set the timer to 25 minutes and you do this task for 25 minutes and during that time you're not allowed to check your email or you know look at your phone or anything you just do concentrating on that task and then after 25 minutes you need to take a five minute break mm -hmm. and you need to get up and you know walk around and do, do something else and then you can you can do like 25 minutes again but the the way it works for me is that it 25 minutes is like a perfect time because it's 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 short enough that you can feel like okay, I, I can I can do this for twenty five minutes. Right. It, it doesn't seem like an eternity. Um, and when once you've done it, once you've like spent twenty minutes on it, most of the time you're you're really you're into it. You it, that sort of um, it goes away a little bit of that feeling that you know can't find a word. But yeah, when you don't really feel like you want to do do something. Um, and then most of the time you just fin you end up finishing it. You you just do another twenty five minutes and you're done. So that's something I do on days when I don't have a lot of energy or inspiration. I I can I can do that all day. Just do like twenty five minutes of that. Take mm -hmm. a break for five minutes. Come back and you make sure you actually get up and and, and just move around as well. Because otherwise, the problem is on like like the opposite is when you're too inspired and you know really in the flow of things. I can sit down and for like four hours without realizing, and <laughs> you feel like you're, you're, um, you get your back starts hurting, and you, it, it's not good for you either. So, it's uh, I I I really like doing that. It's a cool mm. tool to 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 have, and it's also um, it really makes it obvious for you if you if you focus because I sometimes I have a day and I. I 
at the end of the day, I look at my, okay, I, I, I got some work done, but was this an effective work day? Um, I don't really have a boss. I just, there's no one to tell me like you did well today or, um, and right. that's something, but if I use this, the, the 25 minute, like the Pomodoro, I can, it gets really obvious when I lose focus. Mm-hmm. Cause otherwise you can sit and you think you're like, uh, multitasking, you're working on something and you're checking your email or, you know, texting a friend and it's not obvious to you that you're losing like concentration focus all the time. So, um, that is a good way to just keep track of your, how you, how you work, how you focus when you're working and you just take breaks and you do like something completely just relax. Um, mm. so it's a lot better for you as well because multitasking just, just tires your brain really quickly and right. it's not an effective way to work. So, so that's, that's a, the technique I, I like. That's a great way to just say, I'm doing only this thing for this amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, almost, give, almost gives you like superpowers mm-hmm. because nowadays when I used to doing that. So right. when you really do like single tasking and I know someone wrote about it, just like you sit in a, in a room with a clean desk and you have like these post-it notes that says just what you, the tasks you're gonna, you know, do. And you have that in the computer and you, you nothing else, no phone in the room. And, and that's, I think you, you can do stuff that you couldn't normally do because you spend too, so much energy and focus on things around you that are not really important right then. Yeah. I like that a lot. And it's, like you said, it's a very manageable amount of time to just say, look, I can take 25 minutes and not be distracted and not, I can mm-hmm. wait 25 minutes to check my phone or my email or whatever. And it does seem manageable. It's, it's actually a trick I like to use a lot for exercise. I, oh, yeah. I, I like to do like a very like, um, like high interval um, and, or high intensity interval type training yeah. where it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be doing it very long, but I'm going to work very hard yeah. while I'm doing it. And I can trick myself into saying, all right, I, I can work out for 25 minutes. You know, that's yeah. nothing. You know, I could do anything for 25 minutes. Like yeah. you can kind of suffer through stuff. <laughs> yes. So it, Absolutely. It's good. And I, I think it's also nice for like avoiding like feeling like you're doing work when really you're just like you're compressing a kick drum for 25 minutes. It's, mm-hmm. It's like kind of a waste of time. Yeah. What do they call that? There's a name for it. When you when you, you feel like you're working, but you're not really, like you're deleting emails on your phone and you feel like you're yeah. accomplishing something, but it's not really work. Um, and, right. and that's also easy to get into. So when you have these 25 minutes, you know there is a specific thing you need to do. do. You're not going to set like 25 minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete some emails for 25 minutes. You're not going to do that. Yeah. You're going to do actual work during that time. So, yeah. And sometimes I use, like, if there's something I really feel like I don't want to do, um, like write up really, you know, an email that's going to be really difficult to write. Um, I might just do like 10 minutes mm-hmm. just to get things started. Because um, then 25 minutes might be too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if it's something like you're really like dreading. So yeah, you could you could definitely do less, but timers are are great either way. It's just a great tool. Yeah, and sometimes I think like if it's the, that type of activity, and you say for ten minutes, a mm-hmm. lot of times once you get going, you you kind of get in the flow of it, and you can yeah, because starting starting is always the hardest part. It, it's always the hardest part for me. Yeah, no doubt. Like just sitting down, opening the computer to do work. Yeah, is the hardest part in a lot of ways. Yeah. And yeah, some uh, there's a name for that as well. I, just like instead of thinking, okay, I'm gonna go for a jog tomorrow morning, you just think, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get out of bed, and I'm gonna put the shoes on. That yeah. that's the plan. And once you have the shoes on, it's, I mean, it's so easy to just go out and have a run. So you, you just sort of trick your mind a little bit, uh-huh. and that, that can be really and that's sort of the same thing. Like I'm gonna do this for th- for ten minutes, and you know, in a way that. Once I've done it for ten minutes, I'm gonna I can do it for another twenty minutes, and I'm gonna just finish it. <laughs> and if I don't, at least I did ten minutes of it. So either way, you win. Right. It's really funny how much we have to play mind games even with ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then you know, there's a whole other aspect, I guess, with other people too. But um, 
yeah, just sometimes you got to just fool yourself into doing things. Yeah. <laughs> you, That's you a lot end, of that. <laughs> you end up the book actually with a bit yeah. about dealing with people, which I yes. think is so important that like, you know, people forget like you have to sort of be able to deal with other people and yeah. be like a reasonable person to be around. I think I heard this, maybe it was like, uh, it might have been Neil Gaiman's um, commencement speech. I could be totally wrong about that, but mm -hmm. where they say there's like kind of like three things that make a good worker. And, and if you can get two out of three, you're going to be okay. Yeah. And it's like, you do good work, you do it on time, and you're mm -hmm. pleasant to be around. Yeah. Like if, you, if you can get two or three, two out of the three, you're probably in good shape. <laughs> They'll put up with your yeah. bad attitude if you do good work and it's on time. Yeah, you know, if you're pleasant to be with and you yeah. do good work and it's a little late, usually people will put up with it. <laughs> you need uh, at least yeah. two of those. Uh, I think everyone has experienced that coworker that just gets away with everything because he or she is just so charming. And I was like, yeah, I, right. I've, I've, had, I've had a few of those, and it's it's quite interesting too to watch but it's, it can be frustrating <laughs> as well yeah. if you work with them oh uh, we can't fire her she's yeah. so sweet i mean she means well <laughs> she's late but yeah. you know it is good work when she's done but <laughs> if you if you, can, if you can make someone laugh i mean it's it's you're gonna have a have an advantage in life i think because it's hard to dislike someone who makes you laugh so yeah you can you can get away with a lot of stuff well that's yeah. not necessarily a good good plan to have though you need Getting something else to back them. it up. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's good to, to set out to to get away with with bad stuff. It's better to try to do things mm. in a proper way or or look for another job. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think uh, maybe we'll start to wrap this up. Um, but let me ask you: If you have a, uh, do you have any uh, favorite tools you like to use? Like um, any. Any, whether it's plugin or gear, like anything you find yourself turning to a lot these days? Anything new um, that you're excited about? Or, old, yeah. or tried and true, trusted old devices? I was, I was asked a question on a podcast, it was probably, a, I don't know, a year and a half ago, and I think I, I, I still use the same tools. Like my, my favorite tools are still the same, and, mm. and, and one is quite, maybe not boring, but it's um, the uh, FabFilter Pro Q2 EQ. Mm. It's just a really good all-round EQ. Um, I like a lot. I use that for like probably eighty percent of all the EQ I do. And then I have a few others that I do for more like specific tasks. I like the um, Kush Audio um, Electra EQ. Mm -hmm. That's really cool for just sort of you don't. There's no numbers on it, so you're not don't really know what frequencies you go. Oh, there are, but you 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 can't see like. It's like in a um, param fully parametric EQ, so you, you you just end up using your ears more, and there's something about it. It just sort of you can really hear if you if you, if you um, just turn up the gain on on the, one of the bands, and you just you know, sort of sweep the frequencies, and you really hear the stuff. You, uh, I that's the stuff. That's that's the sound I want to get rid of. That's the sound I'm looking for to. And that's really cool for that. Um, mm. It's like a character EQ. But then, the I love the uh, the Muke compressor. You know it from uh, Klanghelm, which is a really cool. It's like um, three different tube compressors in one, uh -huh. uh, and it's really inexpensive as well. Um, and I use that a lot for more like colored, more obvious compression. Hmm. Uh, it's a really cool sound. Uh, put it on the master bus sometimes. Uh, you can just do like a. 2 dB of, of gain reduction and you can really hear the sound of it and it's just I, I like that a lot mm. um, any other tools um, I, I mean I like playing around with the standard tools and just you know that's, that's, that's a lot of what my tips are about as well mm. to to use pretty basic tools I, I pretty seldom uh, name a specific plugin um i think you can do, do most stuff with you know just the stock plugins in your door yeah but some some plugins to just get you there faster and i i uh, honestly i sometimes feel like that there, there, there's so many of these like um sort of ai type plugins 
coming out. Yeah. Um, that I do a lot of, of things uh, just in one plugin. And to me, that, that's really cool. But at the same time, I, I, it kills a little bit of the creativity for me just to, I, I like having everything separate so I can really sort of play around with each stage of the, you know, each hmm. part of the chain. Um, but I do use a lot of, of, of those as well. Um, yeah. You, you, look, you <laughs> like finding your own way. That's part of the fun. Yeah. And yeah. I, I kind of like sticking to my, the tools I'm used to and, and just, you know, tr exploring them because most of them are pretty deep uh, anyway. Um, and and I, as I said, I, I use a lot of saturation and distortion. I love mm -hmm. like uh, um, tape plugins, like transformer emulations and tube emulations. I use a lot of that. Um, sometimes I use that's both like EQ and compression for me. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, I, I think that if if I were to to just take away all those, all the saturation and distortion on my tracks, I, I would probably have used a lot more compression. But I, I, I prefer the, um, it, it's more like a non-intrusive, more natural sound to just give things a little bit of distortion without mm. being obvious distortion. Right. And that's, yeah. I, I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a trick in itself to to get a more polished maybe a bit more quote unquote professional mix uh to to just use like light distortion saturation on a lot of different elements in your mix and it's easier to to get things to fit together hmm. yeah i find that yeah. too they kind of like uh round out a little bit and yeah sit together nicely and yeah like i mean it, it's something i learned with guitar just um actually looking at the waveforms of my clean guitar compared to when yeah. I kick on the distortion and it becomes very straight and the clean has a lot of peaks and valleys with the distorted mm -hmm. guitar because of the sustain and you know everything is kind of like in, in a very extreme way of course but I can yeah. see how you know something more subtle would give you a similar effect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah, cool absolutely <laughs> Nice. So, uh, anything? Uh, you said you got a second edition coming up. Is there a timeline for that of the book, Making Sound? Um, yeah, it's been <laughs> it's been delayed so many times. Um, it looks like it's gonna be out at the end of the summer. Um, oh, nice. Because I it's finished, but it's it's being like uh, yeah, it's being all like design and stuff going on, um, right. and editing and stuff. So. Um, so I think, yeah, um, I'd say August. Nice. That's cool. Something yeah. to look forward to. Yeah. Cool. So is there any place you'd like people to go to check you out to see what you're up to? Obviously, we got the the site for the book is makingsound.co. Yeah. Co. So you can, you, yeah, you can go there and, and, and um, download a free excerpt of the book um, and get on the mailing list. You get a, a lot of free stuff sent to you as well. Um, some really cool, um, if I may say so myself, uh, sample libraries that, I've, that I, I, I worked on for a long time uh, that you get for free and um, yeah, some other stuff as well. So that's that's a good idea if you want to get more nice tips and tricks from me. Yeah, And the Twitter account is it's a good way. Of, and that's probably the best place to uh, get in contact with me as well. And that's at page. magnetic sound, but magnetic has no vowels. So at yes. M G N T C sound. <laughs> yes. All right, that's cool. Great. Well, All thanks right. thanks so much, Christopher. I appreciate your time. Thank you. So again, yeah, everyone check out Making Sound. It's makingsound.co, the Twitter page. There's a lot of cool stuff on Pro Audio Files too that's worth checking oh, out. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, those those are really nice, and and they are pretty much to the point and no nonsense too. Which yeah, is, you, th there's some, there's some um, articles and some videos there as well you can check out. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, through, if you if you Google my name and, and the pro audio files, you get to my stuff there. Very good. Well, again, thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. Thank you for all your work and your contributions to the you know music producer community in general. Oh. it's it's 
been a oh, tremendous help. I, I enjoy it a lot and I've gotten quite a lot out of your work. So I thank you personally too. Oh, great to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you everyone for listening to the Music Production Podcast. Um, yeah, please check out these, these links. They'll be all in the show notes. Uh, lots of good stuff there. And everyone, have a great day.